Hey folks, Jeff Bangender here with Bangender Financial Services. We're doing this a little bit differently today. Uh, we're in front of the camera so you can see the screen and we know sometimes uh, you may not see every word on the screen, but I guarantee you we'll explain every part of that to you. As we talk about 1031 exchanges and, uh, and what the options are, one of the things that we have that is kind of unique is a 1031 exchange into a Delaware Statutory Trust, which is a securitized piece of real estate. But we want to make sure that everybody really understands the 1031 exchange rules in and of themselves first. So for that, I have Bill Ango with Asset Preservation. I'm going to have Bill come on up. And we should have a clicker somewhere handy too. There you are, sir. Thank you. It's Hi there. Right down that way. But. <laughs> My name is Bill Ango and I'm with Asset Preservation. We're a national qualified intermediary for 1031 tax deferred exchanges. Our company's been around for 30 years. We've done over 185,000 exchanges nationwide. Uh, my background is about 32 years in commercial real estate, 22 years of that in the 1031 exchange world. Uh, what my goal is today is to give you an introduction to 1031 exchanges, things you need to be aware of, uh, the rules, uh, what the benefits are, and then uh, we'll go into the timeline of the exchange and things that you need to know about. Let's see if we can get this working. So that's a little bit of my background there. So you have choices when you do an exchange. One option is you can hold on to that property. Uh, sometimes you've got older properties and they can cost you money over time as far as repairs, maintenance, roof, etc. cetera. Uh, your option two is you can sell the property, pay the taxes here in, in whatever year that we're working in, and also you can exchange. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is exchanges. So exchange has been around since 1921. This is not anything new to the tax code. Uh, it's gone through some evolution over the years, as recently as 1991 when they came out with the final regs that changed some of the rules with regards to identification and the flow of the deed and who controls the money when you do an exchange. So let's look at a sale versus an exchange. Uh, in this example you're looking at on the screen, the taxpayer originally bought the property for $400,000 uh, but they've depreciated over the years, and so their basis for tax is actually $100,000. What they did is depreciate the improvements, so that's $300,000 off that $400,000 original purchase price, and today it's worth a million dollars. And as you can see there, uh, they're going to pay a lot of taxes, and taxes have changed over the years. We don't know whether they're going to go up or go down. It just depends on the administration that we're dealing with in, in, in our government. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. You see there, the first tax they get hit with is depreciation recapture. So when you've taken all that $300,000 of depreciation, that's gonna be taxed first 25%. Then the balance of their gain, so they had $900,000 of gain, we had a million dollar sales price, $100,000 basis, so we have $900,000 of gain. So the other $600,000 gets taxed at 20%, and some of you may be saying, well I thought the tax rates were 15%. Yes, it is for a lower level of gain, but when you have gains in excess of $450,000, those taxes go up from 15 to 20%. So we have depreciation recapture, we have the capital gain at 20%, and then you have what's called the net investment tax. The net investment tax came about with Obamacare and says if you have gains or income over 250000 married finally and jointly, they're going to tack another 3.8% on top of the 20% as you see on the screen. Then you have California. California, uh, through Prop 30 a number of years ago during the recession, was passed by Jerry Brown and that created the sliding scale with regards to income taxes here in California. It could be as low as a zero or it could be as high as 13.3%. So in this case, they have $900,000 of gain, so that's going to be taxed on the California level at 12.3%. So you can see there that they've got, you add all that up, that's $339,000 in tax. And you see at the bottom of your screen, if you take away that, that tax, you'd have about $660,000 left over. And you can do whatever you want with that, but if you plan to reinvest the money, you should be looking at it in the exchange because instead of selling, the 1031 codes allows you to sell, defer your taxes, both state and federal, and buy new investment property anywhere in the United States. As you see there, if we sell, we pay the taxes, and we use that as a, say, a 25% down payment or a 75% LTV, you can go buy about $2.64 million worth of property. But with the 1031 exchange, you get to sell, take that million dollars, now that's, you have to take out closing costs and commissions off the top of that, you can sell, 
at the same leverage, look how much more property you can buy. So in that $4 million range. So that's really the benefit. So here's what the tax code says. It says no gain or loss should be recognized on the exchange of real property held for productive use in a trade or business or held for investment it's if such property is exchanged for like kind. Now, one of the things that changed was the word real. We can only do exchanges these days on real estate, not personal property exchanges. So how that impacted folks is that people had farms and ranches and mobile home or um, hotels and motels, they had a lot of personal property that sold with those assets and now they cannot do exchanges on the personal property side, just on the, on the real estate side. So we'll talk about like kind in a minute. The things you cannot do exchanges on, the first item there talks about dealers of real estate. If you're in the business of buying and selling property for a living, such as a, a new home builder or you know, maybe people are flip properties, they're basically saying you cannot do an exchange. You cannot do exchanges on stocks, bonds, or notes, nor can you exchange into or out of a partnership interest. So basically, when we sell, we sell as a taxpayer, we buy as a new taxpayer, we buy a new real estate including what Jeff and, and Jan are talking about today as far as the real property and the, and the DST uh, addition to that. So in talking about the ownership, it's important to note how you hold property in your title is going to be the same way you sell is going to be the same way you purchase. So if you have a husband and wife selling, then the husband and wife would be buying. If you have a property where you own in the LLC with other members, then that entity stays intact. And that is an entity doing the exchange. If you own in a corporation, that corporation, the taxpayer, is the one doing the exchange. So this page just talks about that. Often confused is the term like kind when we do an exchange. Uh, many people are under the understanding that if they sell a rental house, they have to buy another rental house. But if you see all the items flying in on the screen, you see solar fields, you see wind farms, you see cell tower sites, you see apartments, you see retail office. All of that is like kind to another anywhere in the United States. So you can sell four houses and, and buy an office building. You can sell four houses and buy into multiple DSTs. So you have that flexibility with regards to an exchange. So this is what's called the exchange equation, the numbers. And if you're new to 1031s, this is an easy way to remember it. You'll hear people say, buy an equal or greater value when you do an exchange. So in the example here, you see that they're selling for $900,000. They've got an outstanding loan of $300,000. And therefore, after closing costs and commissions are left over, they have $540,000 left over. Now, this is not the IRS regulations. This is, if you don't want to pay any taxes, here are the two items that you need to do. Number one, it says up there, reinvest all of your exchange proceeds. So in, in this example, the proceeds are $540,000. I reinvest those as a down payment on the million two purchase price. And you see the new loan is $660,000. So the two items at the top, did you reinvest all of your exchange proceeds? Yes. Two, did you acquire property of the same or greater debt? Yes. So the far right column that you see here, there's zero left over, there's zero boot. If there's boot left over, there's going to be taxes. So here's the second example. We sell for the same amount, but we buy it for a lesser amount, $700,000. We only reinvest four forty dollars of the five forty, dollars so there's going to be $100,000 cash left over. That's fine. Maybe people need to pay off credit card debt or college loans or they just want some cash out of the deal for whatever reason. Keep in mind that you'll pay taxes on that $100,000. But same thing holds true with the loan. You see the loan is $40,000 less than the old loan, so they're gonna pay taxes just like they received cash. So we sold for a certain amount, we bought for a lesser amount. That difference, $140,000 is considered boot, and they're gonna pay taxes on that. So let's walk through a couple of examples, and this is where the, the DST comes into play. You see the taxpayer is selling a commercial building, and maybe they want to expand their business and buy a, a larger building, maybe has yard. So keep that in mind if, if you're a contractor or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you can do an exchange into a new building for your practice or for your, your business. So in this case, they bought a new property. They put 3 million of the uh, 3.72 down, uh, but they're going to have left over. Normally we call that boot. But that, this is where the DST can also be an option for you, looking at buying into a DST with either money left over or all the money if you want to. It depends on you know, if you want to receive cash and don't want to be a landlord anymore. As Jeff points out, you know, the tenants, toilets, termites, and trash, taxes, you know, the DST is, is a good option for you to look at. 
So let's talk about the delayed exchange process. And all it really is is a sale followed by a purchase. Just like if you were selling your primary residence, when you close escrow, the deed goes to the buyer through your favorite title company. But what's different in the 1031 exchange world is you see the proceeds come to the qualified intermediary to be held. That's our role. In an exchange, we help you document your 1031. We also hold your proceeds in the process and then we help you with the identification process. Then when you're ready to close on your replacement property, we're gonna wire those funds back out to the title company handling the purchase, no matter where it is in the United States, and you wind up with a deed to your replacement property. So simply, an exchange is a sale of investment property followed by the purchase of new investment property. Now let's talk about the timeline. The zero that you see on the lower corner of the screen here, that represents close of escrow. Word, word, to the, word to the wise, and that is this. If you plan to do a 1031 exchange, it needs to be set up with a qualified intermediary prior to close of escrow. If you close escrow and decide after the fact, that's considered a taxable event and you cannot do an exchange. So you need to get us involved. Uh, we help you educate, educate you on the process. Uh, if you're a realtor or a tax advisor, we help educate your clients. Uh, typically, you know, when they put the property on the market, or before, you can get us involved and we can educate them just like we're doing here today. When you close, the proceeds come to the qualified intermediary and that's when the identification period begins. From that closing date, they have 45 days to identify in writing unambiguously the potential replacement property that they're gonna buy in the 1031 tax deferred exchange. The total timeline they have to close on the replacement property is 180 days from the close of the relinquished property. Now, here's something that's very important. There is no regulation of the qualified intermediary industry on a federal level. And what we do at any given time, we're holding millions of dollars of people's money as a qualified intermediary. So it's important whether you work with us or anyone else, you look at the qualifications of that qualified intermediary because there is no licensing per se. Is there a major parent company, like a title company that owns that qualified intermediary? How many years have they been in business? Do they provide security things like uh, bonding and E&O insurance? So it's not just about what they charge for their fee, but how safe is your money gonna be when they're ready to close on the replacement property? Now, something that has uh, come about uh, in the recent months due to the coronavirus was an extension. The uh, National Association of Realtors and other organizations um, asked the IRS for an extension because people were having a hard time either identifying or closing the replacement properties because many businesses were shut down. So the IRS issued the procedure you see up there, the notice 2020-23, and what it essentially says is if you have a time-sensitive event, such as the 45 days or the 180-day timeline, that time-sensitive event will be extended to July 15th of 2020. So if you had started your exchange between April 1st to July 15th, then that timeline would be extended. So I have a couple of examples up here on the screen. You can see if someone closed their relinquished property on January 3rd, their 45th day normally would be and is still February 17th, but their 180th day falls within that window. So their 108th day is gonna be expanded to July 15th. But here, where someone closed their relinquished property February 16th, and normally their 45th day would be April 1st, now they're gonna have until actually July 15th to then identify their property. Their 180 days doesn't get extended, but they have from this date to July 15th to actually then identify. Last example, they closed on April 22nd. Their identification was June 6th and therefore their identification is going to get pushed out to July 15th. So that's just something that uh, you should be aware of if you're going to be selling an asset between now, and which is uh, in May of 2020 and uh, July 15th of 2020. So here are the identification rules. There's three different options as far as how many properties you can identify. The first option is you can identify up to three properties. It doesn't matter the price or order of those properties. They can be anywhere in the United States. You can identify A, B, or C, or you can identify all of those properties and close one, two, or all three of those properties. That's the most commonly used rule. The second option, the 200% rule, essentially states that if you do identify more than three properties, then the value of all those properties combined cannot be more than double the price of the property you're selling. As an example, if you're selling for $500,000 
and you identify four, five, six, or ten properties, all of those properties' combined values cannot be more than a million dollars. So it gets restricted once you start identifying more than three properties. You'll find that in the DST, if you look at that investment, that Jeff would be maybe showing you four, five, six different investments and you'll be identifying the percentage of those various addresses uh, the, of those properties that you'll buy throughout the United States. The last option is the 95% rule, and essentially what that states is that if you do identify more than three properties and their values do exceed double what you're selling for, then you must acquire 95% of that list. So going back to my example, if I'm selling for $500,000 and I identify five properties worth $2 million, that rule basically says I have to buy my whole list. So we like to say an exchange is an integrated plan. You need to be planning ahead when you look at identifying. Now one of the things to keep in mind is you can have your replacement property under contract before you close your old one. So if you're going to do that, if you're a realtor or working with a realtor, one of the things you may want to do is to write the offer on the replacement property contingent upon the relinquished property selling. So that's an option for you. How do we identify? Well, the first option is it says it has to be done in writing. So you can't just call us and say I identify the following properties. You cannot just email us and say here's my list and assign it in a calligraphy font from the computer. It has to be done in writing. It has to unambiguously describe the property or properties that you're considering buying. So 4320 Douglas Boulevard, Roseville, California. Or if you're buying a percentage of the property, then it's going to be that percent of that address of that property you're going to be buying. It has to be sent to us before midnight of the 45th day of the exchange. And it has to be signed by the taxpayer. So a couple of different options that people do is they'll fill out the identification letter that we prepare for them. They put it in the mail and mail it to us before midnight of the 45th day of the exchange. They can hand deliver it to us. Uh, but mostly what happens these days is they'll fill it out, they'll put it on their scanner or put it on their fax machine and send it that way. We also work with DocuSign these days. So DocuSign is another option, option for signing our documents and the identification. What if I'm selling three, I'm consolidating multiple properties, I'm tired of the T's as Jeff pointed out. So I can do that, but something to keep in mind is when the first property closes, that starts the 45 and 180 day clock ticking. So I want to try to get all three of those properties sold as quickly as and together as possible. And when the first one closes, if there's going to be a separate sale, then I've got to try to get the other two closed, hopefully within the 45 days, because then I know what kind of values I'm going to be working with. Because if you can only get property one and two sold, you can't get property three sold, and that's going to really maybe change the value of what you're going to be buying on the other side of the exchange. What if I'm selling one and I'm buying three properties? Again, there are no extensions available in normal terms or normal times uh, to the 180 day period. So you've got to try to get all three of the purchases closed within that 180 day period. Closing exchanges, last minute exchanges are possible. If you're we're seeing a lot of these lately where people are deciding uh, the day before or even a, a few few days before the close of escrow they want to do it they can do an exchange although the maybe the escrow officers prepared the documents you can and are entitled to do an exchange under the federal tax code what you'll need to do is get a hold of us we need to get your information the title company information we want to talk to you we want to know how long have you owned the property for is there seller financing how do you own title of the property just kind of qualify what's going on then we get a hold of the title company, get a copy of the preliminary title report and the purchase and sale contract, and we can prepare our documents and get it out very quickly uh, in a matter of sometimes in minutes uh, to the transaction. So this is what we do. We prepare the exchange agreement, the notice of assignment, and the assignment. So technically what happens is the purchase and sale contract between the buyer and seller gets assigned to the qualified intermediary. Well, why does that need to happen? because under the regulations, the taxpayer cannot have constructive or actual receipt of their proceeds. So those documents tell the escrow officer, do not put the funds in the name of the seller, wire those funds to asset preservation to be held on behalf of the taxpayer. This is how to get a hold of me. I'll leave this up for a few seconds while I'm talking. Uh, easy to get a hold of me at bill at apiexchange.com or my cell phone, 916-832-1031. In addition to this uh, presentation, you can also find us out on the internet. We have a LinkedIn page, we have a, a Facebook page, Twitter page, and YouTube. So we also have additional um, uh, videos on YouTube. With that, 
I am done with my presentation. I'll hand it back off to Jeff. All right, thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate it. So again, those of you that are on the uh, webinar right now, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in. We will get to them at the end. But you know, if you're thinking about a question for Bill, he's gonna stick around and, and we'll go over that. So uh, go ahead and bring up my presentation. I'll just share with you a little bit about um, what is a Delaware Statutory Trust or a DST. And then when I'm done, we have Jana Reyes here as well. She's a uh, local realtor and she'll explain how she uses them with her clients. And then from there, we'll, uh, we have uh, one of our sponsor companies with us and we'll talk about uh, the, you know, what the sponsor company is and how they do these things as well. So as uh, we think about this, so the first thing is a Delaware Statutory Trust is a, a securitized piece of real estate and only available to accredited investors. An accredited investor is somebody that has a million dollar net worth uh, excluding their personal residence, and or they have a $200,000 personal income or $300,000 as a couple, and they're expected to maintain that income. So there are some limitations on the folks that can do this, and we want you to be aware of that. So uh, again, the Delaware Statutory Trust, just uh, some of the definition here, it really is just, uh, it started with a revenue ruling from the IRS it's a 2004-86 and it just says that you can own a beneficial interest in this specially designed trust that uh, has a lot of restrictions in it. They can't, and I'll go through some of them, but the, the sponsor company can't refinance and they can't keep on offering it forever. You know, once the property sold out, it's done. And so it really does have a lot of uh, restrictions that help you as the investor know that, hey, there's a beginning point and an ending point to this um, securitized real estate solution. So as we start to look at it and help you understand kind of how this program works, uh, the lender does make one loan to the DST itself, and you are not responsible for that. If you have leverage on the property and you're coming into this property that has leverage, we don't ask you to sign any documents. You're not guaranteeing the loan. It's a non-recourse loan. You are not responsible for it at all. It also provides the, the lender and the DST um, some guarantees that, uh, or some, not guarantees, but a safety net, if you will, that if you go bankrupt, it's not going to affect anybody else that owns the property. And so we don't have to worry about it from that standpoint. And it does provide protection to you that if the DST were to go bankrupt, it doesn't blow back onto you and cause you a problem either. So that non-recourse debt is very important in this. Uh, it does shield you in a way uh, from some of the other issues. So you don't have any control over this though, and that's the biggest uh, hurdle I think for most investors. You've been operating your own property all your life, you've been in control and in charge. This is a passive investment. Once you go into this, you're letting the big sponsor company manage every aspect, right? We're, you don't call us, you don't call the sponsor company and tell us to raise the rent or fix the roof or do any of that. And we're never going to call you and say, hey, the toilets are broken and we need to fix them, right? It's just all taken care of and you don't have to worry about it, which is the reason to do this, right? There are some limitations that actually make this a the entity that the IRS allows and one of those is again no capital contributions can be made after the product is uh, fully subscribed so in other words if it's a hundred million dollar offering and once we've raised a hundred million that's it and we can never come back to you also known as a capital call we can never come back to you and say hey we need more money because we didn't raise enough or something along that line so we cannot renegotiate uh, our existing mortgages uh, another benefit is, again, we just can't keep this thing going on and on and on forever. Typically with commercial property, it's a 10-year loan, even though, though it might have 30-year amortization, it's due in 10 years is kind of normal for commercial property. So typically these all end before the 10th year. So just bear that in mind as well. Uh, we cannot renegotiate any existing leases. So if we have a triple net lease with a very large institutional uh, client, right, then we can't change that. It is what it is. In an apartment or a, you know, anything multifamily, senior care facilities or storage facilities, 
We do a master lease with a master tenant so that that master tenant is actually renegotiating leases on a month-to-month -month basis with all of the tenants in there. Um, we cannot reinvest the proceeds once we sell the real estate. So when we sell the real estate, we have to send it to you. All of the cash flow from this has to be paid out to you, to the investors, right? So the firm itself cannot keep any of the cash flow and any cash in between the distributions has to be invested in uh, government liquid type of uh, you know T-bills, bank accounts, that stuff. No investing in the stock market or anything like that. What it can offer you is portfolio diversification. Maybe you've got one big property here in California worth a million, two million, five million, whatever. We can take you and diversify you into other parts of the country, you know, 500,000 and 10 different investments, whatever. You can get a lot of diversification with this. Uh, the value is tied to bricks and mortar. This is not a REIT. A lot of people will say, oh, that sounds like a real estate investment trust. No. A real estate investment trust is more like a promise. Hey, we're going to go buy some really good real estate. Trust us. We're going to do a good job. This is, we already own the specific real estate. You're investing in it. We give you a private placement memorandum. It shows you exactly what the rents are, what the financing is. Every aspect of this is detailed in that private placement memorandum. You know what you're getting right up front. Uh, it could be a hedge against uh, inflation if inflation ever comes back. Uh, you know, but it is one of those things. If we can raise the rent, we can keep up with inflation along the way. The income generated could be uh, used to offset any passive losses. So if you have some passive losses and we have passive income, you can offset with that. Potential tax advantages. If you have fully depreciated out your asset, this is an opportunity if you take on new leverage to buy actually more real estate and start the depreciation all over again. We can get into more details. Certainly, you know, we'll want to talk to your tax advisor and make sure it makes sense for you to do that. Uh, and in the event of a profitable sale, it is real estate, right? So there are no guarantees. We're going to sell it when it makes sense to sell it. We're going to assume they're going to sell it and the sponsor company will sell it when there's some capital appreciation and that all gets sent out to all the investors. You are the beneficial owners of this. You benefit from not only the cash flow, but from all the capital appreciation as well. Uh, again, passive income and passive loss. If you have a tax scenario where you're looking to maybe offset some of your passive losses with some passive income, a DST could be the right vehicle for you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I've got a few slides. I just want you to think about your taxes at the end of each year. You know, normally you're having to keep track of everything. How much did you spend? How much rent came in? Absolutely everything. We're just going to send you a tax document. You just give this to your tax person. It outlines every bit of the entire project and your portion of the project. Even if you're doing some, you know, TurboTax or one of those, it will be much easier for you to just fill in the blanks versus you having to keep a ton of records. Some of the past offerings have been pretty impressive. We've done healthcare DSTs. These are, uh, this one happened to be four different healthcare buildings in one uh, DST, which is kind of interesting. We always have beautiful apartment complexes all around the country. You could have one in Florida, one in Texas, Tennessee, you know, just amazing properties. Um, some of these will be uh, the value add or some will be brand new class A. You'll have the choice. It's up to you and we'll display each one of these for you. We'll give you the good and the bad, kind of what to expect from each kind of property. You could have a very, uh, you know, big student housing project. We've done those. Um, you know, those are things that you'll we'll want to talk about because everybody's got a different perspective kind of post COVID, right? What asset is going to do the best long term? And we want to have that candid discussion with you. It might be a, a big corporate tenant that you feel comfortable with that's likely to be around long term, right? So we want to look at each one of these and make sure that you're comfortable with each one. So with that, I, I just like to explain that a little bit. I'm going to bring Jana Reyes up and have her go into the details of what, how she uses it with her clients. So Jana, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Jana Reyes. I'm a local realtor with Keller Williams Realty. And basically, I'm just here today to talk a little bit about how the DST option has been a good fit for some of my clients in circumstances that they've brought to the table. Um, and so here's my contact information. I'll put it up again at the end if you want to jot my number and my email address down. Feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to value property for you or just go over some of these scenarios again um, in person. Uh, this is just a little uh, disclosure. If you are looking to do a DST, you'll want to talk with Jeff and his team a little bit about the requirements to be a, an accredited investor, et cetera, um, so you can get into detail with this um, on, with Jeff. But again, a DST is securitized real estate. I am not licensed to sell DSTs, but I do have clients who um, move in that direction with their 1031 exchange and I'd like to share with you some of the circumstances around those situations. So um, when is securitized real estate the right investment for you? Well here's scenario one. Maybe you own and manage residential uh, rental properties one to four units and you're tired of the termites, the tenants, the toilets and you would love to retire from property management, but you feel trapped in your investments because you rely on the monthly income, you know that cashing out will result in significant capital gains tax, um, as well as depreciation recapture. If you're in this boat, then a DST might be the right solution for you to do a 1031 exchange into a DST. Um, here's scenario two. Maybe you're just fully depreciated out on your rental property and you would love to 1031 exchange into something newer, uh, maybe something in a better neighborhood, something that's lower maintenance, um, but you're afraid that if you list your property for sale that the low inventory levels might make it difficult to find that replacement property and you'll run out of time. As you saw with um, Bill's presentation, you do only have 45 days to identify the replacement property. So if that timeline is scary to you, what you might do is still do an exchange, still list your property, search for something locally, and if you are unable to identify a property locally within those 45 days, then you can use the DST as your backup plan for your IRS reporting. Okay, here's scenario three. Uh, maybe you feel like the market around your investment property has peaked and you would love to sell to capitalize off the high values and exchange into a market with more potential for appreciation, but the idea of managing a property in another county or even another state just sounds like a big headache to you. Well, a 1031 exchange into a DST is a great option because the DST companies really are searching for great growth path areas, um, places where they see potential for appreciation, and with a DST, you're not managing the property. You're not flying to the other property to meet the tenants. You're not trying to find um, contractors in those areas. Everything's handled for you, but you're still getting the um, benefit of, of investing in these other locations. All right, so scenario four. Maybe you're in the process of a 1031 exchange. The property you're selling is $500,000. You find this great replacement property that you're interested in purchasing, but it's only 350. Unfortunately, you run all over town looking for another property that maybe you can purchase for the 150 differential, um, and you can't find one because 150 in our market doesn't really buy anything. And so you contemplate paying uh, taxes on that 150 boot. Well, you don't have to do that because you can actually diversify in your 1031 exchange. You can still purchase the 350 property with some local piece of real estate and then take that 150 and put that portion into a DST. So it's not all or nothing. You can just actually diversify across those two different types of products. All right, here's a scenario five. Maybe you're currently landlording a one to four unit property, but you do everything you can to avoid tenant turnover, including raising rents to the market rate for fear of vacancy and gaps in rental income. Um, DST is a great solution for people in this boat because the multi-unit DST programs offer some tenancy diversification as well as daily apartment pricing models that make sure that the rents that are being collected are at market rate. Um, and that just kind of smooths the um, income fluctuation that a lot of times um, owners of duplexes, et cetera, get really nervous about. 
Um, here's scenario six. Maybe you aren't in a position to obtain a new mortgage for one of many reasons. Maybe you're recently retired. Uh, maybe you've had a change in employment. Maybe you're newly self-employed and you, ha you don't have enough of a track record, but you want or need to exchange a property that is currently leveraged with debt. If you're in this boat, you can go into the DST investment. And the nice thing about those programs is that they do still have the leverage, but the leverage is non-recourse debt. Um, it is corporate debt and you do not as an investor need to personally qualify for that debt. All right, here's scenario seven. In preparing yourself for uh, maybe your passing, like say you're trying to get your estate ready, um, and you know that your spouse after you pass away is not going to want to take over the management of your rental properties, or maybe you have a fear that your heirs might feud over how to handle your assets after you pass away. Um, the DST program is a great, excellent estate planning tool. Um, in the event of your death, the ownership can be divided into portions per your instructions. Your heirs get the step up in basis just like they would if you passed away and left them a duplex here in town. And the illiquid structure and poten uh, potential monthly income can really give your heirs kind of a chance to see what it's like to be part of a managed plan receiving that income. And it gives them a little time to figure out how to um, receive and deal with and manage the, um, the money that you leave to them. So it's a great transitional tool. Um, scenario eight, maybe you just have a lot of cash in the bank. Maybe you don't have anything to sell or do an exchange with, but you're still interested in a DST. Um, good news, you actually can invest just cash into a DST. The minimum is $25,000. If you're doing an exchange, the minimum is $100,000. So um, you can look into just maybe allocating some of your retirement funds or some of your, your personal um, savings into a DST, even if you're not in an exchange situation. Um, so again, here's my information. Feel free to reach out to me and um, I'd really love to answer any questions at the end.